regardless of what type of diet you are following, exercise is going to be very, very important. That being said, with regard to exercise, what type of exercise should you be doing? Well, this is going to depend entirely on Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in and welcome back to another Sunday Q&A. Steven here with Team Euphoric and today's question is with regard to exercise while on the carnivore diet. Originally, I had planned on answering a completely different question, but I've been wanting to do a video on exercise with regard to the carnivore diet and nobody has asked me that question. And just a couple minutes ago, I had logged onto Facebook and the very first post that I saw, it was on the World Carnivore Tribe group and a woman asked, how important is exercise with a carnivore diet? I have a sedentary job and don't have an exercise regimen as of now. So that is going to be the question that I'm going to be answering today because I've been wanting to do this video for a while, but no one has asked me this question. So with regard to exercise, is it important? Regardless of what diet you are on, exercise is going to be important. And exercise, it does not have to be weight training. When I say exercise, I am referring to just movement. Any movement is going to be good. Even something as simple as walking is going to be great exercise. In fact, just yesterday, I had released a video called Top 10 Reasons Walking is Great. I'm going to include a link right up over here if you haven't seen that video. But regardless of what type of diet you are following, exercise is going to be very, very important. That being said, with regard to exercise, what type of exercise should you be doing? Well, this is going to depend entirely on your goal. Is your goal to look better, feel better, or perform better? Let's say your goal is to look better. What do you want to do? Do you want to lose fat or do you want to build some muscle? If you want to lose fat, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to calories in versus calories out. If you're in a caloric deficit, you're going to lose weight. If you're in a caloric surplus, you are going to gain weight. And if the amount of calories that you take in is equal to that of your total daily energy expenditure, your weight is going to stay exactly the same. With regard to this point right over here, this is very, very important. Important. And a lot of people, especially in groups like vegan, carnivore, keto, all of these different groups, a lot of people will claim that if you follow this particular diet, you don't need to worry about calories. You can just eat whatever you want. And on this diet, you cannot gain weight. And that is absolutely BS. If you were on the carnivore diet, you still have to be able to be in a calorie deficit. If you want to lose weight, you can't be in a surplus or you're going to gain weight. If you're not sure how many calories you need to consume, I made a video a while back and it was called how many calories do I need? I'm going to include a link right up over here, but essentially you want to be in a calorie deficit if you want to lose weight. So with regard to exercise, what type of exercise is going to be the best? Well, weight training is going to burn 150 to 300 calories for the average person in a one hour training session. And this is going to depend on the intensity of the exercise, the type of exercise that you are doing, what exercise is going to be best. Well, if your main objective is fat loss, then compound exercises are going to be the best exercise because compound exercises involve larger muscle areas and multiple joints. A compound exercise is an exercise that involves two or more joints. So let's say something like pushing or pulling. If you're doing a bench press or a dumbbell press or a lap pull down or a chin up, it involves your shoulder and your elbow. So because multiple joints are moving, that makes it a compound exercise. Whereas something like an isolation exercise, either a bicep curl or a tricep extension, that only involves your elbow. And because it only involves one joint, you're going to be focusing on much smaller areas and fewer muscle groups are going to be involved. So because you are involving less muscles, you're going to be burning less calories. So if you want to burn more calories to make it easier to be in a caloric deficit, if it is your goal to lose weight, then incorporate compound exercises would be more beneficial. Compound exercises, you could think of them as your pushing, pulling, bending, lunging, squatting, and twisting movements. Those are going to be the best when it comes to fat loss. Other things that you could do with regard to exercise is going to be walking. With regard to walking, walking, the average person is going to burn anywhere from 150 to 300 calories in a one hour walk. That is the exact same amount of calories that you would burn from doing weight training. So if it's your goal to lose weight and you're not really too keen on doing weight training, either you're not sure how to use weights or you just not don't want to do it because you don't enjoy it, then you can walk for an hour and get the same fat loss results than you would from doing one hour of weight training. But if you actually want to change the shape of your body, then weight training is going to be superior to walking. Now, let's say you want to burn a little bit more calories. If you are somebody that is of a normal weight and you don't have any joint dysfunction or postural dysfunction, then running is also going to be ex excellent because if you run in one hour of running, you could burn anywhere from 700 to 1000 calories in a one hour run. Now with regard to running, if you are somebody who is severely overweight, if you have postural dysfunction, if you have joint dysfunction, I would not recommend running because it's very, very high impact and it can be very detrimental on your joints. So if you are very, very overweight postural dysfunction, or if you have any type of joint dysfunction, stick to walking first, lose a little bit of the weight and build up a tolerance to that higher impact activities such as running. But those are some things that you could do if it is your goal to lose weight. Now, what if it is your goal to build some muscle? Well, with regard to 
building muscle, there are two requirements. One, you need to have some type of external stimulus in order to stimulate the muscles to grow. And then two, you need an adequate amount of protein. With regard to the external stimulus, you want to follow two principles. One is going to be the principle of progressive overload. And two is the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand. With regard to the progressive overload principle, essentially what you are doing if you want to build muscle is every single workout, you should push yourself a little bit harder than you did the workout prior. If you lifted a hundred pounds for 10 repetitions, the next workout, if you were able to complete it, try and do 105 pounds for 10 repetitions. If you were only able to do hundred pounds for eight and you wanted to get to 10 repetitions, then try doing hundred pounds for 10 repetitions. There are many ways that you can do progressive overload. A few of them are increasing the number of reps, increasing the number of sets. You can decrease the rest periods. You can increase the weight. So the load, you can also increase the time under tension. And those are just a few of the ways that you can use progressive overload into your training program. With regard to the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, your body essentially is going to adapt to the stimulus that you provide it with. So if it is your main objective to build some muscle, what exactly do you want to do? Do you want to build up your arms? Do you want to build up your legs? Do you want to build up your chest? Because the exercise that you do is going to elicit a very specific response and not only is the exercise going to elicit a response, but also the implement that you are using. If you are always doing chin-ups on a straight bar, your body is going to get used to doing chin-ups on a straight bar. So if you want to change it up a little bit and allow your body to kind of get confused a little bit and work a little bit harder, you need to provide it with a new stimulus. So doing something like chin-ups on a set of rings is going to be a new stimulus for you. And because it's a new stimulus, your body is going to have to adapt to that stimulus by building muscle or getting stronger. So you want to gradually increase the intensity when you are performing any type of exercise and you also want to change up the different stimuli based off of the response that you are trying to elicit. And then the next requirement to building muscle is going to be making sure that you have an adequate amount of protein. With regard to protein, how much is an adequate amount? Well, it's going to depend on individual to individual basis. Generally, your protein requirements are going to come in a range and that range is going to be anywhere from 0.8 grams to 1.5 grams of pound of body weight. With regard to where exactly should you be in that range, it's going to depend on your calories that you are consuming. If you are in a caloric deficit, your body is going to be in a naturally more catabolic state. Catabolism is muscle breakdown. So you want to consume more protein if you are in a caloric deficit. Whereas if you are in a caloric surplus, when you are in a surplus, your body is going to be in a naturally more anabolic state. So because your body is naturally more anabolic, your protein requirements are not going to be quite as high and you could get away with the lower end of that range. So if you are in a caloric deficit, you would want to get closer to that 1.5, especially if you are in a very high deficit. If you're in a small small deficit, then you could get away with maybe 1.1 or 1.2 grams. And then if you're in a caloric surplus, you can get away with the lower end of that range somewhere near 0.8. This is also true for people that are of normal weight. If you are somebody that is very, very obese or very, very heavy, let's say you weigh 500 pounds, you would be better off going based off of your lean body mass rather than your total body weight. Because let's say you do weigh 500 pounds. If you are in a caloric deficit, 1.5 times 500 is 750. You do not need 750 grams of protein to be able to build muscle. So this requirement right over here, it is more for people that are of normal weight. If you are severely overweight, then I would not go based off of this 0.8 to 1.5 gram range, but that's pretty much it for building muscle. Now, the next thing, what if it is your goal to feel better? Well, if it's your goal to feel better, then ideally you would want to train according to your physiological level of stress. With regard to this point right over here, I made a video months back and it was called, how hard should you train? I'm gonna include a link right up over here if you wanna watch that video but I go into it much in much more detail. Essentially, with regard to your training, every single person is going to have a different level of tolerance with regard to physiological stress. And with regard to stress, we have many different stressors. A lot of people, they tend to overemphasize on the mental stressors, but there are a lot of physical stressors and emotional stressors as well. We have physical, thermal, chemical. There are many different types of stressors and physiologically, our bodies are incapable of differentiating between these different types of stressors. As far as our bodies are concerned, stress is stress. And whenever our bodies are under stress, our bodies are going to secrete the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. And if it is constantly elevated throughout the day, what's going to happen is your testosterone levels are going to be suppressed, which is going to make it harder to build muscle. And also it is going to make it easier to store fat. So if you are somebody that is under a very, very high level of physiological stress, you would want to do some very, very light activity and gradually build up a tolerance toward more vigorous exercise. Whereas if you are somebody that has very, very low levels of stress and your body is able to handle a tremendous 
tremendous amount of stress that you can put on it, then you can get away with doing very, very intense and vigorous exercise. And now that we're on the topic of training for the purposes of feeling better, what if you are somebody that has joint pain? Well, if you have joint pain, then doing joint mobilizations would be ex excellent exercise for you to incorporate. Mobilizations are essentially movements that take the joint through its various ranges of motion. And one of the things with regard to mobilizations that makes them really, really good is the synovial fluid that lubricates our joints and makes it nice and warm and easy to move around. When you do joint mobilizations, you are going to build up the synovial fluid around the joint. And by building that up, what's going to happen is your joints are going to be able to move a lot more freely and they are going to feel a lot more warm. Joint mobilizations are also really, really good, even if you don't have joint pain, to do them as a warm up prior to doing your exercise. I actually made a video years back and it was a pre-workout mobilization routine. I'm going to include a link right up over here to that video, but that would be an excellent routine for you to do prior to your weight training session as it targets every single joint in the body. And then another thing would be, let's say you have muscular stiffness. If you have muscular stiffness, then incorporating some stretching into your program would be absolutely excellent. With regard to stretching, I'm a big fan of either PNF stretching or myofascial stretching. Those are going to be much, much more effective than something like static stretching. With regard to static stretching, there's nothing wrong with it. You can do it and you will get some results, but you are going to get much better results and it's going to be much more effective and efficient to do something like PNF stretching or myofascial stretching. And then let's say that it is not your goal to either look better or feel better. What if it is your goal to perform better? Well, with regard to performing better, you would want to periodize an exercise training program based off of what exactly your sport is or what the performance is that you would like to improve. With regard to periodization, I made a video months back. It was called Periodization Training Explained. I'm going to include a link right up over here if you want to check that out. But essentially, if you are an athlete and you want to do some type of training program, when you are periodizing a program, there are different phases that you would want to incorporate. When it comes to the different training phases, we have the preparatory phase, and then we have the competitive phase. And then within each of those two phases, there are also sub phases. In the preparatory phase, we have a general preparatory phase, and then we have a specific preparatory phase. And then in the competitive phase, we have a general competitive phase, and then we have a specific competitive phase. And then once the season is over, there's also a transitional phase where you would focus on rehab or prehab exercises to help strengthen all the muscles that you neglected while you were training for your particular sport. Let's go back a little bit to the preparatory and competitive phases. With regard to the preparatory, again, we have a general preparatory phase and a specific preparatory phase. In the general preparatory phase, this is where you are going to focus on things like anatomical adaptation, hypertrophy training, and also things like maximum strength training, depending on what sport you are playing. And with regard to the specific preparation, in the specific preparation, you are doing more biomotor ability training. With regard to biomotor abilities, there are eight of them. There is speed, strength, power, endurance, agility, flexibility, coordination, and balance. So depending on what biomotor ability is predominant in your sport, you would want to train those during the general preparation. Then we would move on to the competitive phase. In the competitive phase, we have the general competitive phase, and then we have the specific competitive phase. In the general competitive phase, what we want to do is maintain everything that we gained during the general and specific preparation. We're not really trying to get any stronger. We're not trying to get any bigger in terms of muscle mass. All we want to do during this phase is maintain what we gained. And then in the specific competitive phase, what we would want to do is incorporate sport specific exercises. The reason we are incorporating sport specific exercises during this phase of the training program is because the competitive phase is approaching. So as we get closer, we want to be able to mimic the movements that we are going to be performing in a sport. I'm going to use my athletes as an example. I work with a lot of professional fighters and a lot of boxers. When we get closer and closer to the fight, all of the movements that we are doing in our training, we try to mimic the movements that they are going to be performing in the ring. Some of the exercises that I will do with my professional boxers to mimic a punch, I will have them do something like taking a medicine ball, throwing it against a rebounder. That way they can mimic the punch to mimic an uppercut. I might give them something like a kettlebell and have them do one arm kettlebell swings, mimicking the uppercut. And I will do all of those different types of movements. Let's say I am training an NHL player. Well, with regard to NHL and hockey, there is going to be a lot of twisting. So any type of twisting sport, let's say you're doing either hockey, tennis, golf, any of those types of sports, you would want to incorporate a lot of twisting movements into your training program, particularly during the specific competitive phase and even during the specific preparation. But those are just a few of the ways that you can incorporate training into the carnivore diet. If you have any other questions with regard to training while on the carnivore diet, go ahead, ask your questions down in the comment section. I will get back to you as soon as possible. But that's pretty much it for today's video. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to smash that like button so I know to make more of these types of videos in the future. And if you're either new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell 
as I will be uploading new videos every single day. That's it for today's video. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you again tomorrow.